Hi, and welcome to the organizers panel of the Legal and Policy Dev Room at FOSDEM. You stuck with us this long. This is the end of our second afternoon of material, and we organizers wanted to come here, talk about a few relevant topics of the day, and say hello to you and tell you who we are. So shall we introduce ourselves, everybody? Um, some of us have already been on, uh, on moderating panels, but um, my name is Karen Sandler. I'm the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy. I care about software freedom because I'm a cyborg lawyer and I have a pacemaker defibrillator implanted and I would love to see the source code in my own body. So Alex. Um Okay, I'm I'm Alexander Sande. I'm FSFE's policy consultant, and um, yeah, therefore, I'm trying to make sure that everybody in the European Union knows about free software and the advantages of free software, and especially decision makers. And um, yeah, so that's my job. And I hand over to uh, Bradley. So I'm Bradley Kuhn from Software Freedom Conservancy. I'm the policy fellow there. I've been helping organize this panel for a while and excited to work uh, with our, our new team that those of you who have seen our panel in person at FOSDEM uh, in the past uh, see that we're a little different group here. So, so Richard. Oh, Max. <laughs> <laughs> I just continue. All right. So my name is uh, Max Mehl. I work for the Free Software Foundation Europe. Uh, I work there in different areas. I started with policy and meanwhile, also more in the legal area where I coordinate a few initiatives like reuse, for instance, which we will definitely talk about later. And um, yeah, I stuck with the FSB for a long time. And uh, yeah, I care about free software too, as many of or the most or all people here in this panel. And, and Richard. Uh, I'm Richard Richard Fontana. I'm a lawyer at Red Hat. Um, my my work involves uh, mostly open source and free software related uh, legal matters, um, and I've been doing that for a long time. And I've been involved in some way in helping uh, organize this dev room, this dev room, excuse me, since pretty much the beginning. So happy to be here again. Yes, and now is a really good opportunity to say, like, thanks to, thanks to my fellow core organizers who have done this all of these years um, with me, and um, and thanks to our new organizers for participating with us. This was a really, really challenging and also fun year, um, as it turned out. Thanks to um, thanks to all of your participation. I want to take a moment to thank. Tom Marble, who had been a co-organizer for previous dev rooms, who always worked so, so hard. We keenly missed his absence this year. Um, and I hope he's watching along and know that we really appreciate all of his past work and uh, and have thought about what he would say at every step of the process. I'm sure he's watching right now and will be saying something in IRC for those of you following along in the chat. So I think that leads us perfectly to the first topic to talk about. Normally on this panel, we talk about the what we see are themes that come up in our dev room or um, or really important issues of the day. And I think uh, one of the things that is the the the, the most poignant uh, is simply uh, events in the age of COVID and how um, and how operating during the pandemic is uh, is an opportunity for software freedom, but also um, a challenge as proprietary solutions are foisted upon us. Yeah, I've been watching this really carefully this year, and uh, and and I'm I'm very concerned that that what we're, what, the video chat quickly became a center of how people got their work done. And at least here in the United States, and I'm curious to hear from my European colleagues that's happened there, it's so um, dominated by a single proprietary software company, namely Zoom, uh, that people in the United States use Zoom as a verb to mean video chat now. Uh, they talk about doing a Zoom, talking on Zoom, being on Zoom. Uh, and it, it's very frustrating to even tell people that there's an alternative that's available. Um, we're using Big Blue Button to record this panel. Jitsi is being used by FOSDEM uh, to do the to do the uh, live chat uh, during the conference, uh, and they are excellent uh, free software technologies. That we just have had great challenges, uh, at least 
the beef scene here in the U.S. Uh, getting others to pay attention to? Are you all seeing the same thing in Europe? Has it been difficult to get people to switch off proprietary video chat platforms? I would say definitely, yeah. Um, we had those issues as well, especially in the in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but I, I have to say say that we also see saw a lot of positive examples here. Like for instance, in the educational sector, big blue button is a known thing. Uh, I know a few students uh, right now, younger and older, and most of them are aware of using Big Blue Button when I invited them uh, for, uh, yeah, for an associations meeting. So at least that's some good news. And we have a lot of activists uh, who spread the word about those alternatives, not only regarding video chat but also other collaboration uh, tools that we see. So there's also the bright side of things. Uh, also, maybe to add here, what we've seen in the very beginning um, of the crisis is that uh, many companies use the word uh, or the term free software in order to promote their um, software, which isn't free software. And they, uh, it's more likely a shareware, a freeware or whatever. And they had like a subscription for three months or stuff like this. And they really try to get on the market with uh, using the term free software. And uh, this is also what we've seen uh, in, the, in the beginning and what we tried to challenge with, uh, with some news articles and press release on that. But um, yeah, this is also something we should keep in mind uh, for future that, um, yeah, that the term free software um, is, is not connected to these kind of offers. Yeah. yeah, indeed. And, I, and uh, since, since the early 2000s, I've encouraged people to just, uh, at least when speaking in English, to say software freedom instead, uh, because it's uh, less ambiguous. You know, do you have software freedom is the question to ask people. And it's not just happening, I think, with video chat during the pandemic. There's just this whole um, group of, uh, of proprietary technologies, many of which replace technologies that were invented in, uh, in free software. So if you look at things like Slack, uh, and other proprietary technologies. We've had uh, free software chat uh, clients since the beginning of the internet in the early 1990s. And now these companies have found a way to sort of insinuate proprietary uh, uh, technologies that replace standing free software applications uh, in the marketplace. And so uh, it, it was so, so bad that uh, I recently participated in an online conference where every technology uh, for the speakers was a proprietary technology the speaker's guide was in google docs and the uh the the back it wasn't on slack but it was on discord was the speaker chat and the video platform for recording talks was proprietary and the online collaborate the, the 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 venue platform for the day of uh was a was under a uh you know a, a semi-free software license under a you know, non-commercial use only style license so so uh, so even free software conferences are, are having the challenge and it's kind of it's it's very impressive uh that fosdom while it's been uh, certainly very difficult to organize as a dev room uh remotely uh this year uh, one of the things that one of the organizers of fosdom told me uh last week was that their goal was to prove uh, to the world that you could run a conference as large as FOSDEM as an online event during COVID using only free software. And, uh, and they've, uh, the, as we've seen uh, as the last uh, two days, they have succeeded and we've, we've pulled this off. So, so it's really impressive. And I, while, while, I, while I've had my frustrations of trying to organize this event remotely, it has not been fun. And I, I wish Tom Marble was back many times uh, and he's been laughing at me every time I talk to him, uh, appropriately so because uh, he did all the work in the previous years. I, I'm really glad that, uh, that, that this has happened so that we can show that these events can be done with all free software. Yeah, I, I was going to say that, that I don't actually feel like this year, this past year has been really significantly different. And I think that's one of the points you were making, Bradley. I, I, I've watched, uh, you know, the, the proliferation of, of non-free, non-open source tools, um, even in, in sort of, you know, technical or developer communities that are oriented towards, towards free software development for uh, almost as long as I've been involved in kind of doing legal work in this area, at least, maybe not going back further than that. So, so maybe things have accelerated somewhat, but I, I see it more as um, a continuation of, uh, of a pattern. I think that's true. And I think that, like, I think that what we saw was like a, a highlighting and exacerbation of that trend. Um, and, and seeing that happen in the health space, and we had a whole panel um, that mostly talked about this issue. Um, I, you know, I, I've, I think that the, the idea of 
focusing on software freedom has never been more important because so many of these non-free sharing solutions are being promulgated and people think that they're, uh, and, and they're helpful in an immediate emergency like the Medtronic ventilator that has your, you know, that, that is a lot allowed for use, but doesn't grant the rights to go forward. It, we're planning for this pandemic and our emergency needs, but we're not planning for the next pandemic. Yeah, and I, I think Fontana, you're, you're absolutely correct that this has been an ongoing problem uh, uh, that's been exacerbated, especially in the developer communities. When I think about it, just to compare it to some of the other uh, panels we had uh, in the compliance panel, we didn't talk too much about the compliance tools thing. And the main reason uh, as a moderator, I didn't push on that issue so much is because I know many of the, most of the tools that people use, software tools are, are non-free. Uh, Falsology was mentioned on the panel, uh, which is the only uh, FOSS tool for compliance, more or less. There's a few others, but, uh, but it's certainly the most popular one. All the other tools that are very popular uh, are proprietary. Uh, and even the collaboration communities that develop those uh, standards and tools, uh, they're using proprietary software, a major compliance tools process. You have to agree to a proprietary license and agree not to reverse engineer the mailing list software just to join the mailing list of that project. Uh, so, so we're we're really seeing that become more and more that that uh, that people doing FOSS aren't using FOSS tools, uh, and I I can't help but mention GitHub, which is the most popular FOSS development site, is a proprietary software site with tons of proprietary JavaScript that people are using to develop FOSS every day. So, uh, so I think I think that's something that that we the pandemic has just made more obvious. But uh, you're absolutely right, Fontana. It was there for some time now. Yeah, it's sad because we actually have the tools, like we have the alternative tools that work like Big Blue Button. And if we were all to put our weight behind them, they would improve and we would be, it would be this, this amazing thing. But instead, because we're, we're, we're instead as a society doubling down on these proprietary solutions and we free software contributors are the ones who are locking that in. So, so what what do folks uh, think? So, so what are some other themes that you think have come up uh, over the last uh, the last uh, year that we ought to address? Is there is there anything else that was major that happened this year that we should uh, we should be sure to talk about? I mean, in terms of health, uh, what I found uh, kind of uh, really interesting was the discussions about the tracing apps. So, um, so there's also somehow a light at the end of the tunnel and uh, this discussion around these tracing apps and interoperability and that we can um, yeah, share data across borders, especially in Europe, that's an issue. And um, so this helped a lot, in, uh, especially uh, on the decision maker side. So they now have a better understanding of why open source free software is uh, so important. And um, yeah, why, uh, especially if it comes to um, sharing across borders and across languages, it is so important that we have uh, this tracing app in Spain, in uh, Germany, and in, um, um, I don't know, in Austria. Uh, in a different language, but they are able to talk to each other. And this is only possible because it is free software. And we had a huge debate here in Europe around uh, these tracing apps and especially uh, around that it is free software. And so um, this might help at the end. And uh, also on the health panel, we've seen that there had been uh, loads of hackathons, for example, um, that the results have uh, been published as free software because it is a good idea to do so. And uh, I think this panel um, it was also very interesting in this regard. Yeah, if you speak uh, about uh, health apps and, and the corona tracing apps, uh, it, it's still quite interesting that the platform for all of this, uh, well, we have two gatekeepers here with uh, Google and Apple. And it uh, took the free software community uh, quite a few of months to make this possible like to have these exposure notifications API all implemented with free software and so people can just install it from for instance F Troid for Android phones um, so we're again in a situation where the software itself is free uh, but the platform is not so it's quite interesting also for the yeah, for publicly funded uh, software to see basically can I really use it in with as much software freedom as possible. And it turns out it's still quite interesting and a long way to go.
Yeah, it, the, certainly when you compare it to the United States, uh, uh, the, all the news stories were about Google and Apple were going to solve the contact tracing problem and all of the apps are proprietary that people are using here. So I'm so glad to hear that in Europe, uh, as, as as we heard about in, in the, you know, I, I, when I was listening to the, um, uh, the the DMA t talk. Uh, I mean, the the, the DMA talk uh, was sort of saying, well, we need to make this law so much better in Europe. And I was looking at his slides of of stuff that's already in your laws in, in, in Europe, and I'm like, I wish we had that much. Uh, like what you already have in Europe, I wish we had here in the U.S. Because there are no laws that that are that are very friendly to interoperability and and free software the way that you already have uh, in Europe. So so kudos to you all who've done policy work in in Europe to, to make that happen because over the last 20 years. Because uh, we 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 unfortunately do not have a system where it's easy for us to to get that stuff into our legislation here in the United States. Yep, and a shout out to Deb and Hong Fuchs talk um, for uh, for for bringing the conversation global. Um, we are we are a global community as free software contributors, um, and it's uh, it's important to to learn from all of the the work being done um, in different places, especially where it's successful. And I I agree, it's. Uh, uh, the U.S. is not uh, is not a great example of that, which maybe is a good transition to talk about something that has happened in the last year that we didn't cover in the Dev Room, Bradley. I don't know if it makes sense to talk about just to fill people in on the DMCA stuff when we talk about how bad things are in the in the United States. <laughs> Or Richard, I don't know if you have any. Yeah, well, thoughts I on mean, it. The, the startup. Uh, Fontana and I have talked about this a lot. I mean, the startup culture in the U.S. has had some influence uh, on FOSS, and, and not usually particularly good. Fontana, do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about what's happened in the last year with with what some of the startups have done uh, with regard to licensing? That's been really much in the news the last uh, the last year. Yeah, so I remember we. We actually talked about this in our organizers panel last year. I think it was last year and not not the year before. Um, and and it, it was a, a major topic then. So so we were seeing this trend of, um, you know, I want to say startups, uh, but it's not. You know, I, I I'm not sure it's it's limited to what I would call startups, but smaller tech companies that have grown up around a sort of vendor controlled. Um, uh, free software slash open source project, um, you, you know, typically um, using a certain type of governance model that emphasizes, um, you know, you're using a, a kind of asymmetrical contributor agreement, a CLA or, or whatever, and um, not really having a, a very, you know, a significant contributor community in part because these these companies tend to be hostile to to outside contributors for various reasons. Um, and then th these companies sort of uh, a few years ago um, started experimenting with licensing models that resembled, uh, you know, sort of free and open source software licenses in some respects, but but deviated from them in significant ways. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, MongoDB and the server-side public license was the first notable example of this, in, at least in the modern era, and that was about three or four years ago now. Um, but we saw a number of other companies moving in this direction, um, and we talked about that a little bit, little bit last year. So very recently, um, the latest company to do something like this was Elastic. Uh, earlier this month announced that it was going to uh, use um, the server-side public license, so the license that MongoDB had introduced for um, for some of its projects, and um, so so uh, you, you know this this is um, you know from my perspective at least a, a, a pretty disturbing development. Um, th these companies um, have you know in, in part been sort of blurring the meaning of. Of you know it's it's really open source, not free software. So they've been they've been blurring the meaning of open source and and sort of trying to to push on the boundaries of the open source definition. Um, and and you know this um, the 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 main feature of of these various licenses is sort of um, uh, you know I would say sort of use restrictions so so kind of prohibitions on on use cases by competitors uh essentially um you know it, to a large extent these companies are concerned about competition from 
uh, you know, cloud providers, and and that's that's kind of motivated some of these these license changes. Um, but you know, kind of more more broadly, I, I think this just sort of is part of a, a, a longer theme of of you know tension that's existed, uh, you know, between sort of like free software or open source as a means of of kind of building a a, a, a a basis for business success versus the kind of ethical goals that that uh, lie behind, you know, free software and 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 I would say open source as well. And and uh, we we know year after year we can we continue to see interesting examples of this. And this is sort of the the the, the latest, I guess. And interestingly, we had a talk in our uh, in our dev room this year uh, you know, about this kind of proprietary licensing business model. I, I think when we were doing the acceptance uh, uh, for the talk for the talks, I was sort of most skeptical about that because I didn't want to provide a, a mouthpiece to the proprietary relicensing regime uh, that MongoDB and Elastic and, and other such companies are putting forward. Uh, the, the really nice thing, I, I, I kept an open mind about it, and I actually think it ended up, uh, I, I would give that talk the you know, best talk of the year award on our track, because I think it really laid out uh, in a very clear way um, how the, the, the Q, uh, QT uh, situation uh, impacted the KDE project and how the KDE project, by being a strong existing free software project, probably, and, and still to this day, I think probably the largest user of Qt uh, of anybody uh, in, in any software space at all, was able to leverage their, uh, their community power to assure that uh, Qt remained free software and to bind uh, the company and its successors to continue to improve uh, the free software. Uh, it's quite a magic trick from my point of view that they were able for so long across so many owners of Qt to assure that 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 the public version, the free software version of Qt did not become uh, a, uh, you know, just a, you know, an unmaintained kind of afterthought release. Uh, and, and that's something that I, I think was unique to KDE. I, I disagree a little bit with Cornelius's conclusion that we could do this for any of these projects because I think it was almost an um, artifact of its time uh, that, that uh, open source was not something that someone wanted to market around. Uh, I don't think uh, any cute could go to other customers in the late 1990s and convince them to buy, uh, to, to, you know, but to buy based on it being open source, whereas MongoDB and Elastic are, are seeing that. Uh, the other thing that's really disturbing about the Elastic move, different than the MongoDB move, is they moved from a free software license uh, to this SS public license, which is, is not a FOSS license. Um, and it's played into this view of copyleft versus anti-copyleft because uh, MongoDB tried so hard to convince people the SS public license was the future of copyleft, as they, they put it when they began marketing it. Uh, and here we have Elastic switching from the uh, non-copyleft Apache license to a uh, to SS public license, and so I, I found it very difficult as an activist and a policy person to explain the nuance of well, actually, the SS public license isn't a copyleft license, and if it were, a co if there were a copyleft license they switched to, it might have helped them fight uh, Amazon in the way that they wanted to, uh, but what they did instead is they switched to this non-free license uh, to fight Amazon. So, so I, I, and I have, I'm, I'm curious at how that's playing out in, for my European colleagues in Europe and if folks are, if folks are able to see that nuance in a way they haven't been able to here in the US. Mm, I'm, I'm not so sure whether there's a big difference between uh, the European review and the US review. Uh, definitely troubles also us as well at the FSFE uh, that this happens. Um, Definitely. So I, I think the difference here between the, the KDE Qt model that Cornelius presented uh, and Elastic is, well, Qt and, and KDE, they wanted to cooperate and uh, they were mature enough in, in the sense of like, uh, let, let's cooperate with each other. So they had this agreement and it has been fulfilled also by the successors, basically. So we see here a successful, fruitful uh, cooperation, while as uh, Richard already said, uh, uh, CLA is an asymmetric um, way of uh, contribution and so well this has been basically laid out that this could happen and uh, i think i think a big topic will be how to how like the free software contributors want to interact with companies 
or with uh, organizations that might take their contributions away and make them basically proprietary. So uh, this is a discussion to lead and I think it's not bound to, uh, to the US or to Europe in specific. Um, but yeah, I, I found this maturity uh, discussion quite interesting, uh, a shared theme among uh, like Cornelius talk but also in the compliance panel that you moderated, Bradley, um, which I found definitely interesting. And also <laughs> I would quote Davide from Huawei um, when he says that, um, well, you, you can really see whether a company is um, mature enough if their FOSS compliance is actually a mature process and a good process that they have. And I quite like this that um, yeah, companies thing from the beginning on in free software terms and not this as a thoughtless after product basically and um i, I to be honest i missed a little bit uh, the mention of reuse here <laughs> um because i think this is a perfect example how communities and projects can uh fix clarify their their licensing and their copyright from the start on and um, this is a thing that can be uh created or uh, worked with by organizations and uh, individual developers no matter which size they have or no matter the the project size and uh, i would love to see this more that people care from the very start on uh, like the yocta project that they are actually with every release uh, combined with the software but also that they have uh, properly declared the licensing and copyright of their of their project because i think we, we still um, waste too much energy into fixing problems after they have been created with tools like Fosology, with our which are great and which we need but uh, we should put more effort into fixing those issues before they have been created Yeah, and, and there, and uh, I guess we could tell our uh, our, our audience that there there, there was a, an excellent talk submitted on reuse, uh, and uh, and the, uh, our FSF Europe colleagues were surprised to learn that we had a uh, we had, we had long ago created this rule that, that that unless it's a substitution talk because of a of a of somebody not showing up, uh, we've always made it that anybody any organization that's kind of represented on the organizers panel can only have one talk from their organization in, in, in any given year at Fostum. So, so we did have to turn away so, some excellent talks from your colleagues at FSF Europe uh, under that rule. So, so we're, we're, so, we're sorry that you were unpleasantly surprised by No, by no worries, I, I wasn't really surprised. That, that's fine for me. And I, uh, I love that my colleague, uh, Lucas Lasota had, had his chance to speak in, the, uh, in this track. And uh, if people are interested, I gave a, a similar talk in the open chain dev room. So just a pointer. So, so, so in the interest of a talk, we weren't able to give Karen. Uh, so, so, uh, so, uh, Conservancy had some work this year that I guess we could cover here uh, that we we would have would have submitted a talk about if if not if not for that rule uh, regarding our DMCA work. Do you want to talk a little bit about that that happened this year here in the U.S.? Sure, sure. I was looking to transition to it a little bit before when we were talking about uh, how much worse the laws are in the United States compared to elsewhere in the world. Um, uh, so it seemed like a very uh, easy time to transition to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the United States, which uh, uh, provides prohibitions on uh, circumventing technological protection measures in order to um, to even do uh, lawful uses of uh, uh, of the technology. And so there's a, a, a process every three years where folks are invited to propose exemptions to that rule um, and Conservancy and uh, others have been involved um, on behalf of free software um, uh, uh, throughout. We, we, you know, many of the organizations uh, protest the existence of, um, of the law to begin with um, and, uh, and then engaging in the, the three-year cycle allows us to propose um, uh, exemptions. And so uh, Conservancy in the past, uh, applied for and and won an exemption for smart TVs um, and uh, and I personally participated in one for medical devices um, and uh, and this year Conservancy applied for um, a, a number of of new exemptions um, ones to allow us to um, to get around uh, to basically allow us to circumvent so that we can see what software is running in a device so we can know if there's uh, if there's a GPL violation. And so basically circumvention being used in order to hide uh, uh, 
copyright infringement. So uh, it's sort of a novel argument for the Library of Congress in the United States, and I'm looking forward to see how that uh, plays out. Uh, we've also applied for one for routers, which connects back to our router freedom talk that we had earlier in the dev room. Um, and uh, we had Bradley help me out. What was our, we, we, we are the only organization that was yeah. uh, was unwise enough to file yeah. three and, exemption requests. <laughs> and we filed one for, for a, you know, a small expansion of the, the privacy uh, restrictions oh, right. uh, that are in, uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a privacy allowance already in the law here in the US, but uh, one of our filings uh, looks for, you know, a kind of a small, a small expansion of that uh, privacy uh, exemption that already exists. Uh, which is uh, which uh, which that that one sort of if it's not granted it's not as big of a deal because the privacy exemption in the law is still pretty is already pretty broad which which is fortunate uh, but uh, but we're trying to sit you know just try to move that edge edge that a little bit forward uh, in our in our exemption request right and with the the highlighting that that if we have control over our software we're going to use it to protect our privacy um, and then I personally was also involved in an expansion of the medical devices one too. And so I'm, I'm excited about that process. Um, you know, it's not as, it, it's, it's, it's granular, but by moving the needle each time we start to see real freedom. And I think that because I think um, that what happens in the United States on these uh, issues does have something of a reverberating effect globally. So it's good for people to stay up to date. Yeah, and, and uh, as as part of that process, I uh, this year I I did uh, some I, I spent two days kind of uh, after we filed those I, I went digging, trying to figure out why the DMCA is such a horrible law here in the U.S. Uh, and uh, it's it's very it's very interesting history uh, that that it, it is it is worldwide affecting because it's uh, because it's based on um, a, a WTO uh, uh, Act uh, the, the the world the World Copyright Act I believe it's called uh, WCT. Uh, it, it turns out the U.S. kind of unsurprisingly implemented uh, uh, used the existence of this to bring in uh, lots of things that media companies, which of course many of which are based here in the U.S., uh, wanted uh, as far as restrictions go. Uh, so our law here in the U.S. goes much further than say the EUCD does in Europe. Uh, but it's really a worldwide problem. And the amazing thing is is that that this this all started back in the early 90s. And so and then the, the MCA is passed in the late 90s. So this is this is some 22 years of bad policy that we've had. And uh, and, and many people who are probably watching our dev room like weren't even <laughs> were children when all of this policy went into place. And so uh, we, we've looked at really trying to educate more uh, about why these policies exist and how bad they are, uh, like things like the MCA. Uh, because most people have grown up with these as standards uh, and and the chilling effects that they create have become a regular part of life, uh, not just for free software, but for all software. Yeah, in this regard, it, just a note, it was also quite interesting that the DMCA case about uh, around uh, YouTube DL had also an effect on uh, European hosters, for instance. So we had a few cases here, at least, which I know personally in Germany, where their mirrors of the software also had to be taken down. And this is uh, quite interesting that uh, you might have bad re regulation in the US, but it has definitely an effect on uh, on Europe as well, uh, as well as the other way around. Um, yeah, I just noticed that uh, we had uh, still one talk uh, which we didn't speak about yet, uh, which is uh, the GIF open source tax break uh, talk. And uh, perhaps Alex, you want to talk about this a little bit since you, you saw it as I know. Uh, yes, yes, uh, I, I attended this. It was uh, also quite interesting. I mean, it's also a general question: uh, How can we finance uh, free software projects? And um, it's it's not about a tax break. Maybe uh, it's it's a it's a general and a fundamental question: How we can uh, get money into this? Uh, one solution can be um, due to um, yeah these tax thingies uh, they have in, in, in France, like you spend uh, $10,000 and you get 66%, uh, I think it was uh, like this, uh, back from the state, uh, if you if it's like for the for the whole uh, community and stuff like this. So we have something similar in, in Germany. Um, so, um, but 
I think it's a it's a general thing. So in Europe, for example, we have the Horizon 2020, a big research program. Um, this uh, has billions of dollars, and I think a lot of uh, more or more money could go into free software projects. Uh, as well, we have this um, open tech funds and stuff like this, and discussions around uh, funding in general. And this is something we should uh, also think about and. Um, yeah, share some ideas and best practices and I also think it's uh, on, on the government side to uh, fund uh, free software projects. Um, they use free software and they should also fund it and it's also good for our whole society and therefore um, there should be funds available in order to support um, these funds. As we've seen now in the corona crisis, it would be good to have some solutions in place before and um yeah so here um yeah state money uh, could could be a game changer uh, in the future and we should make sure that um there are funds available uh, in order to make sure that there are good free software solutions in place uh, for for other crises but also for the normal situation as well Yeah, there have been really interesting proposals in the United States over the years to uh, provide tax breaks that would have uh, real impact on the uh, on software freedom uh, contributors in the United States. Things like um, uh, things that uh, uh, po proposals that were designed to uh, to benefit artists um, that would uh, would provide benefit for free software developers. So, um, in the United States, if you make a donation of your code to a charity you can deduct the cost only the cost so if you're an artist for example you can deduct the cost of the painting like the canvas and the paints but you can't deduct your time and so even if you're a world famous painter and you could you know anyone else could sell your painting for millions of dollars you can only take a tax deduction of your materials and so there have been proposals in the united states that um that have been to change that but none of those bills have passed um and so it's just interesting to to hear about um you know uh, possibilities elsewhere and to possibly revive some of those conversations in the united states too So, so hopefully, uh, so this is obviously we, we this is a, the pre-recorded part of our session. Uh, given that we're we're at the end of the FOSM schedule, by now probably all the online stuff should hopefully be working uh, it, it, without any glitches. So we're going to hopefully join you all uh, in the online chat uh, after this and be able to to take uh, questions from those of you that have have uh, watched our, our entire Devrim here uh, for the virtual. Uh, legal and policy panel and uh from my point of view i'd be glad to be back in brussels next year so hopefully uh, all the vaccines work and uh and uh, COVID, co coronavirus is the same as the flu uh, by the time we by the time uh, fosdem rolls around again uh, we can only hope <laughs> Yeah, I want to once again thank the FOSDEM organizers. It's so much work to put on a conference like this, and they just did so much more work to make sure that nobody had to use proprietary software, and that's so awesome. And I'm sorry we're not in person where we can't stand up and applaud them and also thank them in the hallway. And, uh, yeah, so, I, you know, I, I just wanted to, to mention that. And then also we're also happy in the past we've had this time uh, to hear about feedback from you all um, in terms of what you'd like to see in the future and play you know ways that we can improve the legal and policy dev room and so we'd like to address questions first and then um, feedback but if for some reason we don't have the live q and a um, feel free to contact us and and give us that feedback bradley do you want to tell them all what they should do in the room <laughs> Um, I, 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 we, uh, we, we don't know all the details at the time of recording, uh, but uh, there's probably stuff uh, on the FOSDEM website and, and show you how to, how to talk to us next as we, as we wrap up here. So it no, will be obvious was, by the time they see this. I was joking. I was joking. I was, you normally say, clean the room. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's true. We, we, the, people don't have to pick up their, the, the, if, if there's any trash you left behind, it's in your own house, uh, your own home right now. So. Uh, yeah, you, usually we have to clean up the, the venue. Um, so clean so, up your house now. <laughs> yeah, like, like, okay, everybody go clean your house and make sure yeah. that it's ready <laughs> Immediately. for the next, the next group uh, when they come in on Monday. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thanks to my co-organizers for another FOSDEM. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. And we'll do Q&A now. Bye. <laughs>
think you should get started. Wow. Well, we have made it to the end of FOSDEM 2021. This is the last session of our legal and policy dev room. I want to thank the audience for sticking with us and being here for this whole day. Um, we've still got some time though. So we organizers are here to answer all the questions that you might have. And, um, and yeah, so I'm gonna just start going through the questions in the channel again by how they were upvoted. So we'll start with the first one, um, which is from Krishner, which is, uh, what did you miss most about the physical FOSDEM? And what was the positive aspect of the online event for you personally? So, so I missed waffles and I made the waffle recipe as recommended. I was told by my co-panelists that I should not bring the batter out to show it on camera. I did not have time to make the waffle before, but as soon as this is over, I'm going to make the Fosdem waffles, which they won't be as good. Yeah, I don't miss that I that my feet don't hurt. Uh, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> awesome. I, I miss the, the hallway experience, definitely. So uh, the chatter, uh, but I, I have to say, I have to admit, I'm really impressed by how this has been pulled off by, by FOSDEM, uh, how the experience came across uh, the talks and, and the discussions afterwards. So really good work, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, also uh, all these social parts and uh, social events beside the FOSDEM itself, um, this is what I'm missing. I'm missing Brussels and uh, yeah, but uh, Max just said, uh, great thank you to, to the organizers of this uh, virtual FOSDEM here. It went very, very well. It was uh, quite a lot of fun and um, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, it made so much fun. And I, I, I want to put a really fine point on the fact that we were talking a lot in our pre-record about the questions of conferences requiring proprietary software like Zoom. Uh, this conference was done with 100% free software. Uh, I hope you all had a good experience, but from our point of view, it was completely seamless. Uh, I, I mean, it's not, it's, of course, it's not as good as a live event, uh, uh, but this is the best online conference I've attended. And I think it's completely unreasonable for anybody to argue they have to use proprietary software to run online events now. Uh, the, there was one piece of proprietary software in all this, one CAPTCHA that you had to get through uh, to make the, if you made the account on chat.fosdem.org. But uh, you know, for, for that little you know, 100 lines of code to be the only proprietary software involved in all of this, uh, please support Fosdem. They, I helped them launch the uh, the T-shirt, and I was the first person to buy a sweatshirt because I happened to be on IRC at like two in the morning Europe time when they launched it. Uh, so I, I bought a sweatshirt. I crashed the database, but I'm getting my sweatshirt anyway. But I encourage you all to go buy the T-shirts and sweatshirts and support Fosdem. Uh, there are mostly volunteers doing this uh, to make this happen, and it's been amazing. I echo that. They did an incredible job. Um, I, I, I miss seeing them all in person. I miss seeing all of you in person. It's not the same, although I am surprised that uh, it was so engaging and so all consuming that it was just like a real FOSDEM where I didn't have a chance to eat or drink anything the whole time. <laughs> um, but, uh, but and I also miss the chocolate in addition to missing all of you. So Richard, what about you? Oh, I mean, for, for me, Brussels is a totally magical place this time of year despite the the weather which is slightly better typically than than the weather where i'm i'm at now um in the northeast us um but it's um it just has a special place in my heart i've been going to to Boston for so many years now um but the um you know the online conference is really impressive i have to say i'm, I'm really happy to see how well that's worked out so the next question uh, that was upvoted is a follow-up to this one, I think, which is to panelists from the U.S., how does it feel that at the end of the sessions and follow-up discussions, you still have several hours before it is getting dark? The question is the other way around. I, I got up at 4.30 both days. Uh, the first day, none of my alarms work, and Karen had to call me. Um, second day, that the, the alarms did work. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's really it's really the waking up that's the issue, not the not the rest of the day. It doesn't doesn't help that much. <laughs> it's very weird to have a whole like to have FOSDEM and then have like a day with my family. Um, that is super strange and really lovely. Um, and and also you know again makes me miss everybody more. But it's snowing here. Um, so it's like very, very brightly light outside. And it reminds me of the year where it, we had this massive snowstorm at FOSDEM. Fo uh, Richard, what about you? Um, 
Oh, so so much. <laughs> Two years is question. Um, yeah. So uh, I mean, part of the the experience is actually the jet lag, and um, I you know I'm not experiencing any of that now. Um, I I got a full night's sleep, and and that's just like it's it's not quite the same thing, but um, but I can remember what it was like, and and kind of sort of cherish that. If you move to the West Coast, yeah, I basically have the jet lag, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, and it was great that the FOSDEM organizers could uh, could allow it would allow us to do two afternoon sessions rather than a full day session. It really made it a lot uh, a lot more manageable for those of us in other time zones. Yeah, um, I didn't want to get right. up at one thirty. <laughs> all right. So, uh, what's going to be the next hot topic we're going to discuss next year? Let's start with well, the Europeans since they didn't get a chance to answer the previous <laughs> question. <laughs> Well, that's hard. I mean, uh, we kicked the session off with the European source, uh, uh, with the uh, open source strategy by the European Commission. And um, as they just started this, uh, I'm, um, I would love to follow up on this and uh, to see what they've done in the, in the then last year. Um, but uh, also we have seen on the um, DMA and the uh, route of freedom and there's so many um, issues we are working on. And yeah, so it's it's hard to predict what's the most important one. Uh, there are so many and uh, we've seen a lot and most of them are, yeah, um, uh, will be there, I guess, uh, also next year. Yeah, I think these are the policy topics on the legal side, also really hard to predict. Um, I guess we, we share the same issues there perhaps another uprise another project that goes to sspl um but perhaps also that uh developers think about clas uh, this asymmetric uh relationship with the companies that they're growing into um perhaps we will see some discussion there i hope so um but otherwise yeah i think in the chat it was mentioned the uh, uh, google versus oracle could be a topic maybe depends on the outcome but yeah yeah, and on a, on a general side, the, the learnings from the Corona crisis, and um, so we also discussed discussed it here uh, in the pre recorded talk a bit, and uh, I'm pretty sure that will um, yeah, will keep us busy for for this year as well. Bradley, did you I want think, to add anything since I cut you? Yeah, off? I, I think I think that what decides our content is is a lot of times what submissions we get from all of you, and we encourage people to submit talks. Uh, when the CFP opens, you know, watch the FOSDEM mailing list, which is where it's posted first. Uh, we'll try to promote it as many places as we can, but uh, we, we're, we can only do as well as, as the talk submissions uh, that we get. Uh, and we, we're we committed to making this the place where you can give a talk about an advanced topic like we saw. Uh, I, I love that many of the speakers had to apologize when they did something basic, like during the AGPL talk, uh, they had to say, uh, we're going to explain what minified JavaScript is. We know that's too basic, but we, we do want to make sure we cover it. And, and so we want to see more advanced talks, submit them. Yeah, and let us know if you have a suggestions for topics that should be covered, even if you don't want to do the presentation. Sometimes if we feel like there's a really important topic that's not being covered, we'll put together a panel to address it. So, um, you know, just let us give us give us feedback. It's it's very welcome. Um, so to get to the next question. Um, how to make companies stop using the term free software for non free software programs. Um, so, uh, as I just said, uh, we, we tried to challenge this with um, blog posts and press releases and also collected in the wiki alternatives. And um, I think this is um, what we should uh, also continue, like creating awareness, um, trying to prevent people buy or get these products and run into a vendor login. And, um, creating awareness on social networks, like commenting um, if they um, yeah um if they if they tweet about it for example then just post another tweet uh, and and say this is not free software and so yeah prevent people from from uh, running into this vendor login and create awareness i think yeah i yeah, find I think... that inundating people with questions is good like you know the constant this isn't free software um can sometimes wear depending on who you know who the recipient is but it's it's always a good idea but uh, but sometimes just saying you know like asking about whether the software provides the freedoms that we expect free software to provide richard go ahead yeah i mean i i, th I think uh, in a way the the question is ambiguous because uh it could be referring like specifically to the phrase free software 
or kind of in a broader sense, the, the kind of free software in, 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 the, in the sense of free software and open source, because some people use, more people use the term open source in the, in the world to mean approximately the same thing. And, and a, a lot of the abuse we see of, of the, that set of two terms occurs on the open source side because there's, there's actually so, I think there's so little awareness of the, the free software terminology. And I think that the term free software in the, in the English sense of gratis software is, is maybe not as common today. Maybe that, that's just my own, my own warped perception. But I think this is basically a, a linguistic problem. And, and, and the, the, uh, the only way you're going to solve it is, is through kind of a concerted effort to make people aware of what software freedom advocates see as, as the meaning of free software. Yeah, I mean, the term software freedom was coined a long, long ago. I've been encouraging people to, to switch to it as the generic term for what we do since the early 2000s. Many others have done the same. I just say, you know, say software freedom. And the other phrase I've been using a lot right, lately is user rights, rights of the users. And if you focus on those phrases, I think the ambiguities of the, of the linguistic problem uh, melt away. So the next question from JWF is, what role does individual consumer awareness about privacy and open source since the pandemic began? Um, is there opportunity in outreach and advocacy that could be better leveraged in light of the increasing dependence and reliance on digital solutions since COVID-19? It's a tough question. <laughs> I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know how to answer yeah, it. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I, I think that, you know, to some extent, there's been like, we're, we've been on this path for, for people to understand these issues more and more and more every year. Like I've, you know, I remember five, 10 years ago at my family functions, they all thought that I was, you know, I, I saw their eyes glaze over whenever I talked about how um, vulnerable our technology was. And they were very nice to me because they're a really nice family, but, uh, but they had no idea what I was talking about. Whereas that's changed over the last five to 10 years. And, um, and people seem to really understand that we are vulnerable based on the technology that we choose. And it's small steps that we're, we're getting there. And I think that, uh, the, the COVID crisis has cut both ways. Like I think on some ways, people are really open to new solutions. A lot of people, for example, were using Zoom who didn't use Zoom before. So it was like an introduction of proprietary software, unfortunately to them. But if we, the, for the folks I got to first uh, who hadn't been using video chat, they did start using Jitsi um, or Big Blue Button more. And so there have been a lot of opportunities. It's, you know, it's 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 hit or miss. We, we have to really stay focused on on making it about the next pandemic or the next crisis rather than about now, because we have to acknowledge that people are doing the best they can and that everyone is like in a, a really stressful situation. Yeah, I also thought a little bit about it. I also see this, the split between uh, groups of people, like some who are really aware of these, these issues and receptive and others are not. Um, I'm not so sure. Um, I saw a lot of discussions recently about uh, lo those logos, uh, like we, I think in Europe or only in Germany, I'm not sure, these uh, blue angel logo, so where they uh, mark sustainable products. And uh, a colleague of mine is working to get free software for sustainable software, basically, as a requirement. Not sure whether this helps, like these sim simple symbols, how people can see that something is good even if they do not fully understand why it's good, they trust in the logo or in the, uh, yeah, in, in the picture basically. And um, not sure whether that's, that's a solution. Yeah, I, I think, I think that one, one of the things that I recommend, um, so, so my, my, my spouse uh, who didn't regularly use Zoom, of course, is using it every day now uh, for her work uh, for a small nonprofit. I really encourage people go to their community organizations and volunteer to set them up with things like Big Blue Button and Jitsi and other technologies. Uh, it, it, this is a place where vo like direct local c volunteer work can actually help. You, you can't see them in person because it's, it's socially distanced, but you can call them on the phone and talk to them about it uh, and, and possibly help them get set up with uh, alternative technologies to the proprietary ones they need during the pandemic. Okay, so the next question is, where is CopyleftConf this year? Karen, uh, Karen should we pre-announce? 
I mean, I think we we may as well. If okay, you want good. to, I just finished okay. speaking. So, um, so one of the things we were waiting to see how FOSDEM went, uh, because if FOSDEM can organize uh, an online event like this, uh, we figured we 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 could probably uh, draft off of their technology. Um, we are going to focus on trying to do it not all at one time. Uh, I, I am not a big fan of of asking people to get up at weird times to go to conferences. So we're going to try to do it as a seminar series on CopyLeft over uh, over the uh, you know the later part of this year. Uh, so that's what copy left 2021 will be like uh, and we'll announce details on sfconservancy.org when we have them which we do not right now it's really fun to like be there all day talking about issues that we care about like copy left when we're in person but uh virtual conferences are just exhausting so we're gonna probably the sessions will probably be like an, an hour at a time over a few weeks um uh, now a question that may take all the rest of our Q and A time, which is, uh, how is the SSPL not copy left? Well, I, I mean, I, so, so the quote I've been using it's a it's a quote it's a common quote uh, in uh, in various places. I, I don't know who sourced it, uh, but uh, I keep saying uh, every every tool can be used as a weapon if you hold it wrong. And I think that whether or not the SS public license is a copy left is sort of not that interesting of a point. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But even if it is, it's an abusive manipulation of what copyleft was supposed to do. If you design a license that specifically makes it impossible to comply with the license, because you have to, uh, as the, don't, don't forget, SS public license requires that every single piece of software involved in the stack on your computer, derivative work or not, has to be under the SS public license. And no one can actually do that in the real world. We, I have yet to see someone who is licensing the SS public license, uh, licensing outbound on it, who won't take it. As my colleague on the panel here, Richard Fontana, said years ago, inbound equals outbound is the right way to design contribution mechanisms. And that's not what the SS public license is being used for. So I just think it's, it, it's not even worth spending as much time as we've already spent on it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's it, in one sense, it's it's an interesting issue of language, you know, definition. But 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 then, you know, w once you decide where you stand on it, is it, if if a copyleft license is defined as a free software license, or you know, a, a whatever, a Libra license or or open source license that has the features of copyleft, then if you accept the view, which I think is a consensus view now, that SSPL is not a free software and open source license, then that answers the question that it it um, it can't be a copyleft license. Um, but beyond that, I don't I'm not sure it's really a very interesting question that it's really the, um, the, 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 the policy issues about why the, the license isn't a, a free software license is, is the important question to think about. Okay, so we are now at the end of our Q and A session. We're going to go into the um, the uh, what's the hallway track, um, but the live room where you can all join us in Jitsi if you'd like, or interact with us via text. The um, the room link will be provided in the channel. Um, but I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody and to say clean your room. No, I mean, uh, to say thank you for, <laughs> for joining and um, also leave it to my panelists to say anything else they might want to say. Last well, words. Thank you. <laughs> thanks to Foster organizers. Thanks for attending. It was great and hope to see you next year in person. Max. <laughs> I can only second uh, Alex. That has been great. Uh, thanks to my co-panelists here and to the co-organizers. has been a really good experience. But uh, yeah, we notice time zones matter. I hope we can do this <laughs> in Brussels uh, live. <laughs> <laughs>